Hello. A couple of years ago, I started a project to get an 8 bit 65A16 computer running on a breadboard. I got part way through, decided that graphics output was the most interesting part, and built a design using GAL chips. Then life happened, and by the time I had free time to look into it again, I had forgotten almost everything about what I'd done. Breadboards rots, wires come loose, and tracking what and why is almost impossible after the fact. So, onwards, and let's do something even more crazy and less likely to succeed. That's right, I want to design a CPU. No, this is not something that is going to make Intel jealous or AMD worried. I want a device that's simple enough to build using logic chips in DIP form, with a preference for the fixed function 74 series chips over any GAL or programmable logic type devices. Although, I may have to break this rule later. I guess I'll start on breadboards and think about waving a hot soldering iron around much later on. The build options limit the reasonable CPU design goals, hence I'm sticking to a 6502-inspired 8-bit CPU with a 16-bit address bus. 16 address lanes will be more wires than any human should have to patch on a breadboard. I'll go with a von Neumann architecture, mostly because it's more usual and probably simpler to design for. There are some complications in this, mostly around bootstrapping a system of mixed RAM and ROM. And then the exciting part. I want a piped line design. That means I'll go for the typical three cycles of fetch, decode, execute for most instructions, with extended pipelines for certain instructions. First of all, I'll have to design the instruction set. Then I'll design a hardware implementation starting with the core units of registers, ALU, program counter, decode logic, pipeline design, and then wiring things together. I'll try to build pieces of this as I go, presuming I have reasonable confidence that the later stages will be successful. Why start of the instruction set architecture? That is, the choice of registers, instructions, etc. Modern CPUs have almost completely divorced the instruction set architecture from its encoding, and from the micro-architecture implementation. Even looking back at the 70s, the 8008 and the 8080 might well have had very similar instruction sets, but they have very different encodings. Likewise, the Z80 implemented the same core instruction set as the 8080, but in quite a different way. In modern terms, similar performing architectures are often very different at the silicon level, even if they told the same instructions. However, in a small design, all three of these aspects influence each other. There is no cache, no decoding to microops, no dispatcher scheduling work for disparate compute units. Everything will be pretty much hardwired. More important questions will be things like, can I implement the register to register move in a single 8-bit opcode? Or what happens when an instruction takes more than one cycle to execute? Okay, so my goal is to take inspiration from the risk philosophy. RISC and CISC arguments are pretty much nullified by modern superscalar ad border designs, but at this end of the design spectrum, RISC can simplify some aspects and complicate others. All of my main registers will be general purpose. Accessing memory has to be done through register to or from memory instructions. That is, there is no add register to memory content style instruction, like on the 6502. Most instructions must fit in one byte, the memory and CPU clocks will be synchronized, permitting at most one memory operation per cycle. Therefore, in order to retire one instruction per cycle, that's in the optimistic case, it is necessary to limit the instructions to one byte each. However, instructions with a large operand, such as a constant or relative memory address, will need a second byte. I'll have eight registers of eight bits each, although they can be viewed as four 16-bit registers for providing addresses. An observation from programming a few CPUs has been that having too few registers makes life harder. Four 8-bit registers is probably too few if I need a pair to hold an address. For example, copying memory requires a pair of 16-bit addresses, that is, four 8-bit registers. Therefore, eight registers was the compromise. Here's something unusual. The ALU has its own register, acting as a second operand to instructions. It's a bit like the accumulator register in the 6502. I'll also have the four main ALU flags, 
zero, carry, negative, and signed overflow. The program counter is also a register, even if there is limited access to it by the instruction set. Before giving an overview of the instruction set itself, which will be the next episode, I wanted to mention some problems and necessary compromises. Fitting a useful set of instructions into 8 bits when you have 8 registers is somewhat tricky. I'll discuss three topics, ALU operations, register to register moves, and subroutine and stack support. Firstly, consider the ALU instructions, such as add, subtract, and so on. If there are perhaps 10 or more operations, four bits will be required to encode the choice of operation. Can I use a two register form with only an eight bit opcode? In short, no. If we presume selecting ALU versus other instructions only takes one bit, and the choice of operation will be four bits, the total number required will be 11 bits. What about a one register form, perhaps with an implicit choice of second register? Again, this isn't going to happen. It's technically possible to encode it, but it'll take half of the available ops code space. What's the possible solution, apart from to reduce the number of registers? My first idea was to add two specialized registers into the ALU. These registers are not part of the main register file. The ALU operations act on A0 and A1, putting the result into A0 and updating blanks. Apparently, this neatly solves the problem. I would have to add instructions to move registers to and from the ALU, and it'll mean the register file only needs one 8-bit data bus rather than two. However, this means that a simple add of two registers now takes four instructions to achieve. Move each register into place, do the operation, and collect the result. A second idea was to add just one special accumulator to the ALU. An ALU operation would take two instructions, one to choose the operation, that is, decode and enable the right circuits in the ALU. The other would execute the chosen operation with a second register. I'd still need to add another instruction to retrieve the results from the ALU, giving a total of four instructions. The final idea, and the one I've chosen, is to make the ALU instructions take two bytes. The first byte contains the register for input, and the second byte contains the destination register and the ALU operation. It's still necessary to move an operand into the accumulator first, leading to two instructions being necessary. I think this is okay. The 6502 required a fair bit of shuffling of the accumulator and memory to do certain operations. My biggest worry is that it's another two-byte instruction, and another one that interrupts the pipeline. Speaking of the pipeline, the choice of having the second byte hold a destination register rather than the second operand register was a compromise to make the pipeline a bit simpler. Like all instructions, the opcode is fetched and latched. A second cycle decodes this, and the decoded states of the various gates are latched. At the same time, the next opcode is being fetched. The third cycle loads the first operand from the register file. At the same time, the second opcode is decoded. The fourth cycle enables the destination register for a store and computes the result. At the end, the destination register is latched. Another tricky one that's quite annoying. Having a register to register move instruction will consume a lot of opcode space. This is pretty much like the ALU problem. Using quarter of the opcode space for register to register move is not a good idea. The first option is to move the register to the LU and back again. The second option is to use the ALU to do a copy operation. This operation will actually be useful for testing whether a register is zero or negative. The final issue I wanted to raise is that of subroutines. Any useful CPU must have support for calling and returning from subroutines. Fixed branch returns just don't work. The 6502 used a stack located in page one of memory. The disadvantage here is that special instructions are required to push and pop registers. Also, the jump to a subroutine instruction is now very complex. The ARM architecture fixed this by using R14 as a link register, and code generally used R13 as a stack pointer. I don't have enough registers to achieve this, and adding special registers might well be a bad idea. My compromise is to use the pair R7 and 6 as a link register. For a jump to subroutine, this requires a program counter to be internally transferred to the register file, which can be done in the same cycle when the target address is being calculated. For a return from subroutine, 
it's pretty similar. This also allows for a very simple way to jump to a computed address. Again, the concept of a stack is something I can return to. A wise person once said, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. This is true in many areas of life. Designing a CPU such that it can be built with discrete logic will always be a big compromise. I suppose I missed off my biggest two goals of this project, to learn and to have fun. In case it's not completely obvious, I'm speaking from a position of general ignorance rather than experience. I only know what I've learned so far. I want to learn more, perhaps understand what issues faced designers back in the 70s and early 80s. If nothing works, at least I've learned something outside my normal professional domain of software engineering. Anyway, that's where I'll leave this one for now, so as to keep it short. Next time, I'll run quickly through my instruction set design. I will try to keep this series going. I can't promise, though, as this thing known as life keeps interrupting. What triggered the pause of my 65816 project last time was the work and health situations of family. Then I got embarrassed at having left everything so long, and I couldn't get the motivation back to continue. Let's hope that I can get somewhere with this one. Please stick around and enjoy the ride.